Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you, more, you all to the Rules Committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Steve Sherlock, and I'm a state rep from Concord. Uh, Speaker Norelli, Norelli would normally chair this committee, uh, but unfortunately, she had a scheduling conflict, and as the second named member of the committee, I have the honor of uh, being the chair of the Rules Committee today. I should explain, I know there are many of you in this room who have testified at other committee hearings. Rules Committee is unique insofar as that we welcome the public here, that's why we have the public meeting. But the discussion today is between the members of the House. As you probably know, each body uh, adopts the rule by which they will operate over the next session. And that is the role, rule, uh, the role of this committee today to um, make recommendations to the full House, which will be voted on in our session on January 2nd. So although we welcome you here, and we're glad that you're here, uh, the conversation will be between uh, the members of the committee. Uh, just so that you know what we're gonna do, and for the other members of this committee, um, we're gonna start with a deadline, which is very important. I'm gonna ask uh, Representative Richardson to explain the deadlines, and I'm very glad that we have our clerk, Karen Weidler, here with us today. We're going to discuss that. Then we're going to start the whole document of the current rules. And Representative Richardson will discuss the changes. The members of this committee will discuss those changes. And then I'll ask if there's a motion whether to adopt that uh, recommended change. So if any member of the committee has a question, I'd be glad to answer it if I can. If there is isn't, uh, yes, I, I understand what you just said about this being a, a public hearing, and it does relative, is relative just to how we run our house. Right. However, it is a public hearing, and the public does come to uh, the public to be heard. Yeah. yeah. It's my understanding of past practices, and uh, uh, it's always been that this has been uh, for the members of this committee only. But I, I appreciate your input. Mr. Yes. Isn't it just a public meeting, not a public hearing? Correct. That's why they're allowed? Exactly. Correct. Are there any other questions? Seeing then, I'll ask uh, Representative Richardson. I believe he's going to be starting on page 25 of the proposed rules. Important. The next section. Okay, here. thank you. Uh, if you'll turn to page six, uh, uh, as uh, you all are aware, uh, the uh, proposal is to uh, remove two uh, two committees that were formed for the first time uh, two years ago. And on page six, uh, the uh, proposal is to delete the constitutional review and statutory codification of committee. Um, and if you will turn to the next page seven uh, to uh, remove the, or to delete the redress of grievances committee. Uh, and uh, just so we, while we're all talking about that subject, uh, that involves also deleting the duties of those two committees, which appear uh, in paragraph C on page 7, and uh, paragraph <coughs> Q on page 10. So the proposal is to delete the Constitutional Review and Statutory Recodification Committee and the Redress of Grievance Committee, and of course that involves deleting their duties. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I'll let you know what our, our concern on this is um, and why we will be, of course, I think, um, <coughs> not be able to support this. We understand that perhaps these committees may have had undertaken too many things last year. I don't know if that's the best way to describe that or not. Our concern is by just doing away with them, then there's no avenue to deal with these because I, we haven't seen any options. I know. Um, I had spoken with the speaker earlier about maybe a couple of options on things of how we could deal with some of these issues. So I think that's our concern. We now have gone from, from one place back to zero. And I it was hopeful it'd be somewhere, I don't know if it'd be in the middle, but at least somewhere upwards of zero to be able to deal with these issues should they come up in, and were dealt with the speaker and or others the House felt were appropriate to have dealt with in the Manner other than just printing. That's all. So, Representative Tucker. Uh, to second uh, Representative Chandler's thoughts, I'll, I'll speak directly to constitutional review at this point. And if we remove this committee, which was certainly it, it did have its place, and I think it took the place of us as a general court 
thinking that we needed to refer bills over to judiciary to see if they were constitutional or not. This committee did serve a, 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 a purpose for us. Uh, would there be an opportunity to put a special committee in place should the opportunity arise that we need to look at the constitutionality of the bill? If I could yield to that, Mr. Chairman, I think the speaker already has the authority to appoint special committees as, as needed, so I think there is an avenue. And as a former member of that committee, uh, I, I really think that uh, there are other ways to deal with uh, constitutional review uh, other than that committee, and there are better ways to deal with it. And we're, we may not necessarily disagree with that, but we haven't had any option presented where it might be dealt with differently. I guess that's what we're saying. Well, I just, yeah, I, I don't know if it does any good to debate it, but no. I think uh, uh, the judiciary, judiciary Committee uh, has a number of lawyers on the committee, and they certainly deal with constitutional issues, and I think that's a, a, a better way. And, and in those rare cases where uh, the, the Judiciary Committee doesn't feel it can handle it. Uh, uh, there's House Counsel and there's, there's uh, other ways to get legal advice that perhaps are uh, a, a better way to do it than a committee that, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, did not have a lot of legal training and uh, uh, didn't really do a lot of in-depth analysis of constitutional law. Any other comments? Is there a motion regarding this section of the proposed rule? I move to state the sections that would be re redress grievances in section C and then section Q. And the reference to mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. right, redress grievances, constitutional review, and the two C, paragraphs C and Q that deal with the duties. Right. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Any comment before the vote's taken? Oh, uh, is this also a redress as well? The both mm -hmm. will combine, okay. yeah. Yes, I, I definitely promise uh, regarding the redress. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Um, our, Section 1, Article 31 of our Constitution states that the legislator shall assemble for redress of public grievances. And, and when you look at that, they do have to have a type of recourse. And redress is for those who do not have the financial wherewithal to go back to court and fight again. This is an opportunity for their concerns of how government may have offended them and, and get some type of redress if it means that we have to change the laws, which in, the, in fact, that maybe this committee did find cases where we did in fact had to fix some of our laws. This is a committee that, that would help us find those problems. And when you think about redress, uh, where will the re their recourse going to be if we take away this constitutional right from them? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, uh, nice to get an applause. So <coughs> thank you, thank you. Um, in answer to that, I would say that one of the things we found during the last two years and one of the things that was acknowledged in one of the last meetings of the Rules Committee, on which I sat as a substitute, is that when we talk about the redress of grievances, we acknowledged, all of us, that we as a legislature do not have the power to write, to redo individual grievances against court decisions or agency decisions what the purpose of redress of grievances has come to mean over the years is that corrective actions need to be taken when we find that there is a law or an agency action or something that is not working properly and that the place to submit the fix is to the policy committee that has governance over that particular policy area. Uh, to do otherwise seems to me to be bad policy, but on an individual level, unspeakably cruel to people who come to the legislature thinking that their individual problem is going to be overturned or overridden by this legislature and who then find that that's not what's going to happen. Further comments? Representative Tucker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. 
And uh, Representative Weber, you're very correct in the fact that, that the purpose is to find out where the problems are. If we, in fact, remove redress of grievances, how are we going to find out where those problems are to take the corrective action? Oh. Representative Weber. I find out what the problems are by listening to my constituents and deciding whether a bill is needed. And there are 400 of us to listen to our constituents, and you only have to persuade one of them to file a bill. Any further comments? Representative uh, <laughs> Tucker and Representative uh, Jasper after with thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest advantages that we saw with redress of grievances was that we saw in certain cases that there, there was a continual problem. And that only would have came about with the institution of redress of grievances. Because one case with one over here, and then another case over here, and another case over here, they were all individual. However, when you put them all together, we saw that there was a bigger problem. And that way it can be addressed. And it's not just an individual piece of legislation affecting one. It's one that we see as bigger and affecting all. Representative Jasper. Uh, I'm not going to repeat Representative Tucker's uh, comments. I will agree with her in, uh, <coughs> for the most part and not take any exceptions to what she said. Um, mine is more a technical comment as I read this, and I, maybe I'm being overly technical, but as I, as I look at the proposed rules and heard the motion, it would appear that our rules would then be numbered or, or lettered in this case, so the Q would be blank and R would continue, and I would suspect the, um, the intent would be to renumber all after, after P, if we could just read, and I don't think a motion is necessary. No, that's that, a good point. That is, that is the intent, Representative Jasper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Any further comments? Seeing none, those in favor of the motion this pending will raise a hand. Those opposed? In the record reflect that the motion passed on a vote of 6 to 4. The next section. Thank you. Uh, the next change is on page 24, uh, having to do with uh, weapons. And just, I'm sure that the members of the committee are aware of this, but this section relates only to the House chamber, the ante rooms, the cloak rooms, or any portion of the State House adjacent to any of the above. It does not apply to the legislative office building uh, or other areas of the uh, premises that are under the control of the Senate joint, jointly with the House. So this relates to the House chamber, the ante rooms, cloak rooms, and any portion of the State House adjacent there too. Um, this uh, change would revert to the uh, rule that was in effect from, I believe, the 1980s until, well, uh, Representative Eaton corrects me, it says the 1960s, but it's been in effect for many, many years until two years ago when the rule was changed to allow the display of deadly, uh, excuse me, that prevented the display of weapons, but uh, allowed them to be carried. Uh, and this would revert to uh, saying that no person other than law enforcement shall carry or have in their possession a deadly weapon in any of the areas where uh, I've just talked about. And it deletes uh, a phrase that was uh, added, I believe, two years ago, uh, say, saying that a person um, is uh, allowed to exercise self-defense and a defense of others. Um, saying that the rule would not preclude that. So the change is to revert back to what we had from either the 1960s or the 1980s coffee, until uh, two years ago. Thank you. I have two, two issues for this. The first being some, I guess you'd call it a philosophical issue, which I'll address first, and secondly, just some um, factual problems with it. Uh, and I said, philosophically, the problem I have with this, and I mean, obviously, this is a terrible time to talk about guns from any side. I understand that in the light of what's happening. So I wish we didn't even have to have this discussion now, but we're here. So the fact of the matter is, by, by passing, adopting this rule as proposed, without security measures in the State House, which I don't think any of us have ever supported and probably won't for some period of time, without security measures, what we're doing is saying we will, we as members, 
will basically allow members of the public to come in, of which we will have no way of knowing that they, they have a firearm. But we uh, in, are under more scrutiny for not being able to have a firearm and protect ourselves. And I, that's just a concern I have, and protect others that might be in the state house. I, I, don't, I think this doesn't stop any problem, and it might even create more problems, in my opinion. But I really, the problem is, I think it's just, in my opinion, a knee-jerk reaction to to issues as they uh, one happened and were perceived to have happened. So, having said that, then I also have just a couple things in my well, the lines on number that, and I realize these were part of the previous rule, and I had the problem then too. But any portion of the state house where it mentions adjacent to above. I have no idea. Are you going to? I mean, we, and I don't mean this to be facetious, right. but are we going to paint a line outside? What? Because you're subjecting people to arrest, which I will get to in a minute. But when we say adjacent, just what is that? I mean, everyone has a different interpretation of what could be adjacent. I don't know. The other thing is, when we are subject to disciplinary action or arrest, what? what I'll let you finish first. No, that's fine. For the challenge. And then, uh, no, but I'm willing to, yeah. I'm willing oh. to hear okay, feedback on that one right there. That's okay. Oh, is it with Rep. Weber? I didn't see the hand. Because if I'm wrong. Go Rep. Weber. I believe that the Rep. Weber said 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 that the Rep. Is subject to arrest, but under what? Is there a statute that is mentioned? I don't know what is there. A penalty? What's the penalty? I don't know. That, that's something that needs to be touched on. And then the, the last sentence, oh, next, no, the last sentence on the page, or oh, that any person is precluded to legally permitted exercise of self-defense or defense of others. It doesn't mention anything about firearms or guns or anything else in there. So I interpret that to mean that I, even if someone attacks me, I can't even defend myself with my fist. Not that I'd be able to very well. But, or if I see someone attacking someone else, I can't go to their defense without any weapon or anything. And I, I'm not sure that's what we are intending, but it seems like that's what we have intended. So those are my concerns. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, just so it's clear, this uh, revision was not a reflection of anything that happened just recently in the news. This has been underway for some period of time, so I just don't want anybody to think it's a knee-jerk reaction to that. Uh, and we all have very, all of us have very strong feelings about that tragedy and, and how horrible it was. And, and uh, so I just want to clear that that, is, that had nothing to do with this language. What we, uh, uh, what has been proposed here is exactly what was in effect until two years ago, and it was intentionally done that way because uh, we just wanted to say, look, we're just going to go back to what it was. Uh, I will say personally, and I, I know we many people here and in this room have strong feelings about this. I'm a gun owner, I have a permit to carry, but I do not believe that. It is appropriate for people to be in the gallery with weapons and for great students. And uh, I think the appropriate thing for us to do today is, I believe, to go back to what the rule has been for the last 20 years. And uh, uh, then if there's further refinements that need to be made, uh, that's fine. And, and uh, the representative from Bartlett makes some good points, and, and uh, those can be looked at. But I think for the purposes of uh, you know, right now and, and getting us off on the right foot starting in the session, we should go back to the, to the rules that we lived with for many years successfully. Um, what uh, the amendment to Rule 63 is, is taking us back to where we have operated for the last 50 some odd years. It is referred to as the Marshall Codley Rule when someone in the chamber had threatened to shoot Speaker of the House Cobley, who was unsure what to do. We did not have protective services. We did not have state police in the building as we do now. Uh, the only thing we had was the governor's driver, who was a trooper, uh, which who did come over to the House chamber. Um, fortunately, nothing happened that evening. Uh, the 
question was, how do they resolve that at that time? And they came up with Rule 63. The key, according to Marshall Cobley, who has written about it in his book and who I happened to regale in a bar one evening, two or three times maybe, um, to think of the story is that no member uh, may be searched. The only way that they could get that the, uh, the band placed was to search. As to Representative Chandler's objections on the, the last section on self-defense, um, that's deleting those words, which are almost redundant, uh, because that would be covered by the New Hampshire Criminal Code. You always have a right to defend yourself or a third person. Further comments? Um, then Jasper. I won't recover the points that Representative Chandler said. I, I do agree with him. Um, but I will add, add, to, <clears throat> add some thoughts. While I am, I'll tell you, I'm no fan of the idea of weapons in the, in the chamber or the, uh, the gallery, the reality is we have no way of stopping that from happening. And one of my concerns with all of these, these type of rules, laws, or anything, is you only then keep people who probably have no criminal intent to begin with from carrying weapons in and essentially leave the weapons to those who don't care about the rules or the law. And that, that should be a great concern to all of us. Mm -hmm. I think it's a well-known fact that, that people who do commit these type of crimes, their first preference is to commit the crime where they can have good assurance that there will be no one there to take them out. That they go into schools, they go into these places with a fair amount of certainty that they are going to be able to do what they want to do. It will take a certain amount of time for people to get there who have the guns will be able to take them out so they're able to inflict the maximum amount of damage to their intended targets. Uh, and that, that is the sad reality of the situation. And that's why I really think that it is important for us to leave the rule as it is. Um, and it, in terms of defining adjacent to, I would certainly say that the hallways and the stairwells are adjacent to, particularly in the gall gallery. Essentially what we, we have, have done and I agree, these rules were in place, but let's face it, if we could pass a law and never have to re revisit it, the legislature would not be in session very often. 55. <laughs> <laughs> that may not be a bad thing. This one. <laughs> that may not be a bad thing, but that's the reality. So to say that, well, that's the way it was for 50 years doesn't necessarily carry a, a lot of weight in my mind. We have to deal with the changing reality. So that really puts the whole second floor, every bit of the second floor are off limits. Because you can't get off the elevator without being adjacent to the house. You can't, on either end, uh, come up the stairs. You can get on the, uh, the elevators and go to the third floor, but that would, then what is adjacent there? I mean, is the hallway adjacent? There's no, there's no di division from the hallway. It's a hallway all the way around. Doesn't that, in effect, then make actually the two floors of the building off limit to guns by the House rules? And that's not our authority, but that's the practical effect uh, of doing that. And I certainly agree that uh, we ought to have the ability to defend ourselves again and not wait for somebody to come, or if someone else in the House who is not able to defend themselves is being attacked, we should be able to. Um, do that. I'm sure most of us would, but then we're going to be in violation of the rule. This just doesn't make any sense. I don't think it made any sense 40 or 50 years ago, and we shouldn't just continue on by saying, well, that's what we always did. 
Representative Tech, if you comment. Uh, yes, I did. Thank you very much, You're Mr. Welcome. Chair. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, I, first off, I, I don't believe that we're going to be able to control the public uh, through rules if, if they're going to be bringing things in. And uh, more we're uh, speaking to Representative Jasper. This is a violation of the Second Amendment rights of the law-abiding citizens. The law-abiding citizens are, the, are not the ones that we're worried about. If a criminal wants to come in, a criminal is going to come in and get a gun no matter what and carry it. It's the law-abiding citizens, which happen to also be our legislators, that this is going to uh, affect. And, and further on that, uh, we have in the Constitution the right of self-defense as a natural right. It's in our Constitution. I don't think we want to create another gun-free zone where, where violent crimes occur and are committed. Uh, do, do we really want another defenseless zone created, and that being the state house of all places? And my last point, and I'll, I'll get off my, my soapbox okay, here. Much time is, is, I really think this is kind of a feel-good bill, and it can't be enforced. Um, since we're not going to be searching them, I, I don't understand what the purpose of this would do other than make people be in violation of it if they feel they have the right to carry. Thank you. I'm a Second Amendment guy. I have more guns than probably most people should have, and more varieties than anybody should have. Um, and I'm also aware of uh, a long term where the rules were in the back but there were certain members who carried, and there were certain members of law enforcement who were legislators who carried. The problem was, uh, I've been a firearms instructor <coughs> since 1980, and I see a member standing in the audience who is proficient in firearms, who I think would probably agree with me that those who are proficient and even have been through classes, that if you were in the house chamber trying to shoot at the gallery and you have dead on sights that the angle and degree of firing changes completely and you can turn the gallery into a bloodbath and never affect the person that you're trying to get at which would defeat the purpose to begin with particularly if the people carrying the chamber are carrying something like a two inch revolver which seems to be what many carried over the years. Um, and just going back to the original language that's been in place for 50 years would start the process and I have been a proponent for a long time of having the protective services be authorized to carry weapons because I know that they've all been certified by police standards and training and have gone through all that process and and that would be something that uh, could be discussed in a relatively short order and, and put in place in a relatively short order. For the comments, Representative Tucker. Speaking to Representative Eaton's comments, I as a representative would feel more safe sitting in my seat if someone from the gallery were to, say, open fire on us, knowing full well that someone sitting next to me is armed, and not only is that person, probably a good dozen or so around the house is aiming back at them. Further comments? Well, I just got to say that gallery is full of fourth graders, and I just have to disagree with you. Uh, if somebody, if you're thinking about somebody from the floor of the house shooting at somebody in the gallery, I, I think we've got a, a good reason not to allow guns in the state house. Thank you very much. I feel that the one person up in the gallery carrying a, a, a gun sees that there is 20 people on the house floor looking back at him to, to down the scope of their gun. It might dissuade him from shooting. Right. Mm -hmm. Representative Jasper. Uh, I <clears throat> just want to speak to the fact that the, this is all about somebody shooting from a gallery and the assumption is that someone would only shoot from the gallery or attack a member in the state house from the gallery. Um, I, I think that's a, a false assumption, although I certainly um, share some of those, those concerns, but would hope that, that nothing like that would happen because of the fact that people would know this is not a place where you want to come in and try to take people out. But there's also people coming in the back door, people coming in the side doors, 
through the ante room. It, there's not only one possibility of people attacking the house. So I, I would hope that we would not try to, to use the, the idea of people in the gallery or with graders uh, as, a, as a reason, because I think that people who are proficient in firearms would, would recognize that, in fact, if they were to just randomly shoot back with, with those kind of um, potential innocent victims in the way they would not not do so. Uh, but again, I think we preclude this from happening when people know that this is not a, uh, we are not just sitting ducks on the floor of the house. Uh, Representative Chandler, then Representative Tucker. Oh, no, oh, Representative Tucker. It might be something that Representative Chandler potentially Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not sure if I have anything to If we take this out and all members comply, what is our form of defense in our house? Should we have a situation such as that? Uh, for comment, comment I yes. Uh, uh, yeah. um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, my mother taught me how to count, so I can count here, there's no question. <laughs> but having said that, I, I get back to the, the I, which I think are problematic, is the word adjacent and the word arrest. And, uh, is there any thought to trying to fix that either now or sometime? Because adjacent, I mean, as in addition to a couple of things that Representative Jasper mentioned, adjacent is, are in areas that we don't control as part of the house on the side of the floor. They're not house controlled areas always. And when you go, where does the Senate, when you leave the house down on the floor towards the Senate, where does the house? Off and again, I, I just think that's a, if we're going to arrest someone for something, we better be pretty clear where we're going to arrest them. And the other thing is the arrest thing is under what? Ooh, a bar, or what, 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 is, what is that? Can anyone answer that? There's a Richardson. I guess I'm going to say I uh, believe that the rest of the complex is under the control of the Joint uh, Facilities Committee, so I would assume they may want to address this issue as well, and that might clear up the question or, or make the issue of what it is uh, unnecessary to deal with. But, and that may happen, but it hasn't happened. Representative Weber. I just wanted to speak to the issue of arrest because I've now managed to read all the way through the whole sentence, which I hadn't the first time I commented. But it says, and disciplinary action or arrest or both by action of the house. So the house has to do that. That's not just any old any old person. And, and that would be an action of the whole house. Right. Right. And I, I understand that. I read that. But what, is they, what are they being, what is the charge? What's the penalty? What, the house arrests me. OK. <laughs> what happens then? <laughs> where do I, where do, do I go to court? Do I, I don't know. I just. I don't know what the remedy is for the arrest. That's all. I, I, I don't know. And I'm not making light of that because I think it's serious. No, no, I, no, no, I, don't and know. I, I think we've probably gone beyond the point where we're changing anybody's mind about anything. But I do right. believe the, the Constitution does talk about uh, the powers of the House to govern its own procedures. Mm -hmm. And I believe arrest is referred to in the Constitution. So I don't think it's ever been exercised in our lifetimes. But, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at a way to maybe clean up <clears throat> the language, and I'm looking at and you keep sticking upon any portion of the state house adjacent to any of the above. Why can't we take that part out and insert what we mean, the gallery? Well, I think, just speaking to that, I think uh, Representative Richardson raised a good point that maybe that's something we should. This should probably be addressed by the Joint Facilities Committee to set the, uh, the boundaries, and I'm sure that uh, uh, the Senate President would, uh, would, would be glad to, and I'm sure that uh, at some point that could be taken up the Joint Facilities. Uh, I, I, I did, yeah, last thing. I, I believe the House Chamber includes the gallery. The gallery does come into the House Chamber. So that's, any further comments? Representative Jasper. Uh, I'm I would like to offer uh, an amendment, and I reckon it's not going to be about guns, because I recognize that that would probably be futile. But um, after it says, right to stop and search any member of, uh, 
on the house premise on the premises of the house to remove the period and then put back the word or that any person is precluded from legally permitted exercise of self-defense or defense of others, period. In that chair of motion, that is my, my amendment to add that, those words back in. Is there a second Representative Jasper's motion? Representative Pepper. Second. 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 Representative Jasper. And, and just briefly, this doesn't have anything to do with guns. It is merely stating what, what should be always the case anywhere in the state of New Hampshire that a person has the right to self-defense and that a person is also permitted to come to the defense of someone who may be under attack. I can't imagine how anyone would be uh, object, would object to that. Um, you know, yes, we have security, but sometimes attack can very quickly turn into something that results in the death of another. You don't have time to wait for someone else to come there. We need to be able to defend ourselves and each other. Thank you. Is there a motion? I'll second it. I think uh, Representative Tucker has already seconded it. Is there any further comment on uh, Representative Jasper's motion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise their right hand. Those opposed? Let the record reflect that the Representative Jasper's motion passed on vote of 10 to nothing. Is there a motion on this section as amended by Representative Jasper? Is there a second to adopting this section? Representative Weber seconds. Uh, is there any comment before uh, vote is taken? Seeing none, those in favor of the adoption of this section as amended, uh, please uh, raise their right hand. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay, I voted for your motion. <laughs> I appreciate that. I thought that might have been. Uh, those opposed? Okay. The motion carries on a vote of 6 to uh, 4. Representative Richardson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next change is on page 25. We just have a table of contents. There isn't one. Are we going to get one back? Oh. What? We have table, table of contents. contents. There, oh, I, there is a table of contents. Oh, there will be. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any, Mr. Chairman, before you, I, I know that you don't want us to speak, but I would like my objection to my inability to speak today noted in the minutes today because I came up specifically for this hearing with prepared testimony and spent a great deal of time, and it was not clear to myself as a member or to a number of constituents who were here, they were not going to have an opportunity to speak. For the record, my friend, Mr. Litchfield's uh, objection is noted for the record. Any other further business come before the committee? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I apologize. No, no, wait. There was a good question that was asked earlier. Since you voted in this room, we're going to vote on the House. Nobody answered the question, how are you going to protect me coming from the garage to here or in other areas? Nobody answered uh, Representative Tucker's question. It never came up on the protection of us. Uh, that's noted as well. Any other business before coming before the committee? You're from the members of the committee. Seeing that is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 I just want to thank everybody on both sides. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank you too, Mayor, for your input. Uh, your and Sandy for taking the vote. Mr. Chairman, are we going to vote on that motion? Okay, we're going to adjourn. I'll get the motion to adjourn. Say aye. Aye. Thank you. What are your thoughts on? in general on um, that provision as well as uh, what looks to be uh, the, the pending loss of redress and constitutional review committees? Well, certainly the issue of the loss of the redress committee is a constitutional issue. Now, if I were to believe that all petitions received would be sent to a policy committee, it probably is a moot point because if you go back historically, to when the, when the people who wrote the Constitution were practicing the Constitution. There were no standing committees. They just created committees for each bill on the fly, and when they got a petition, they created a committee to address the petition of three or four members. So there's nothing constitutionally that requires that you have a petition for redress committee. What is constitutionally required is that we do, in fact, address, address the petitions. petitions. 
whether that was that done was that done reliably before the creation of the redress committee no it was not it has not been done for approximately a hundred years um, it is a uh, and, and this idea that representative Weber's idea that the house doesn't make restitution the house did make restitution or order restitution and there's a good reason for that. If you look at the construction of the Constitution, Article, I believe it's 15 or 17, gives clear jurisdiction over criminal matters to the, judici to the judiciary. Article 20, because of its reference to jury trials and civil cases, gives clear jurisdiction over jury trial, over civil tr matters, civil trials, to the judiciary. Articles 31 and 32 give jurisdiction over matters of the people against the government to the legislature, the general court, not to the judicatories of the state. In 1819, there was a famous court decision called Merrill versus Sherburn in which the judiciary exempted itself from petitions for redress. They were actually the most frequent object of petitions for redress. And they said, oh, you can't do that anymore. With that, of course, because they were the most frequent object, petitions for redress began to diminish. In addition to that, though the Constitution gives jurisdiction over such matters to the, to the legislature, they began hearing petitions for redress. And because they act more quickly than we do, by their very, the very, the, the, people liked that and started going there, such that by the end of the 19th century, petitions for redress were pre pretty much a, uh, a bygone item. They, they, they exempted themselves, they usurped jurisdiction, and, and redress before the legislature became a thing of the past. Though during the 20th century, there was a board in the governor's office. We gave the governor a budget for making restitution for certain things. You're driving down the road, you break an axle in a pothole, you could seek redress up to $5,000, or restitution up to $5,000 before the governor and council. So what odds would you lay at this point um, that those two committees, redress and constitutional review, are gone? Somewhere between 100% and complete. <laughs> and, um, how hopeful are you uh, specifically regarding uh, redress that the ability to petition uh, the legislature will remain somehow intact, at least for the next two years? Um, if the real, well, first of all, you have to understand the real value in the petitions for redress as we are practicing it. I mean, it, it, you, you, you're, you're reversing a trend that has been going for 190 years. So you're not going to reverse it in two years, three years. I mean, it's just, it takes a lot longer than that. That, we, in, that in four years, we got from no petitions before the legislature to petitions being heard by the legislature, even without restitution, I'd be considered to be something very close to a miracle. Uh, the hand of providence was upon us. That we will figure out some way to listen to the people's petitions, even if it means going back to the ad hoc caucus on redress of grievances, so that we can understand the injuries done by government to the people, it will happen. You figure you'll be prohibited from meeting on the uh, state Maybe. House grounds again? Maybe. <laughs> Do I care? Our job is to listen to the people. That's what it says, anyway. Well, there are certain of us that believe it. Well, Representative Dan, it's a good luck. Thank you. Thank you.